the study of this catechism, this instruction for discipleship. Um, and we're looking at question number two. We have moved on to question number two. And we began talking about comfort, the comfort of the Christian, the comfort of our faith. And question number two then asks, what must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Huh? What must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Answer, three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am set free from all my sins and misery. And third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. Now, one of the things that we are seeing is that this is not just something to know in the sense of just having this uh, data, right, in our head, in our minds. The way I want to uh, propose it to you is that this is actually uh, a movement that God does in our lives of faith. And this is the way I see it as I look to the Bible and see the way God works in our lives. This is what God is doing in our lives. Number one, He is daily convicting us of sin. He is daily revealing, showing the misery, the corruption of the old nature, of the old self. Okay, uh, why is God interested in showing us that? Well, because that old nature, that old self, wants to rule, hmm? wants to take advantage of us, wants to gain the upper hand. Okay, so if it is hidden, if it goes underground, if it does its dirty work unbeknownst to us, um, you know, it kind of gets uh, the upper hand. It takes advantage of us, right? So God is interested in daily revealing, exposing, showing that old man, that old nature, that corruption that is still with us in our members, okay? So he moves us. The Holy Spirit then, there's this movement of faith and repentance by which we become aware, cognizant, convicted of sin. Okay? And we experience um, a contrite heart. The Bible calls it a contrite heart. Right? It's that sorrow. It's that a brokenness of being pierced, broken by the sin that we see dwell in us. See, that is a movement of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does that with His children. To be filled with sorrow for sin, huh? to experience contrition, right? To be convicted of our sins, that's something the Spirit does. So it's not just, notice, it's not just, oh, I know that I am a sinner. Hmm? It's not just that. Oh, I know the doctrine that we are grace sinners. <laughs> it's not just that. Hmm? The way this works in our lives is that the Spirit gives us this actual experience of that knowledge. And we are convicted of it. Okay? Now, does God leave us there just with sorrow for sin and, and the knowledge of sin and the conviction of sin? What does He do? What does He do? Okay, well, some people would say here, well, He brings correction to your life. He causes you to abandon your sin. And that is true, but I want to say, hold on a moment. Not so fast, okay? Because what the Holy Spirit wants to do when you are convicted of sin, 
when you see the death of your corruption and, and you can tell me, how, what are the things that you experience when that happens? Well, we feel sorrow, shame, right? Um, guilt, right? Um, do we, children, are we registering with that? You guys, uh, right? So, so, all of a sudden, we even, we even lose a sense of, a sense of peace, right? A sense of joy. See, Christian and sin, it's not a good combination. We live with it, right? I mean, it's in our members. But the sense of well-being and peace and joy and rest and fellowship and communion that we have, right, is hindered, impeded, diminished, obscured, affected by our sins, right? So, now, what is it that the Holy Spirit wants to do? He wants to give us strength and power so that iniquity and sin will not rule over us. And how will the Holy Spirit do it? Where does the Holy Spirit want to take us? Where? Where? Isaac, where does the Holy Spirit want to take us? To heaven for sure, eventually, but not yet, right? We still have a life to live, God willing. <laughs> and some growing to do and maybe some things to do. In the meantime, when we are convicted of sin and when we see and experience shame, guilt, and these feelings, and we feel this burden, okay, what does the Holy, where does the Holy Spirit want to take us that we would find again peace yes to jesus that's exactly right he wants to bring us to jesus in other words in the midst of our weakness shortcoming failure sin fault whatever you want to call it god wants to come and say yes that's right but i love you I am your father. I die for you. And that is God's way of lifting us up. In other words, we are convicted, we feel the pain of the sin, we feel the brokenness, all of that, you know, in different and varying degrees. Okay? We, we feel the lust of our flesh, right? Because sometimes we haven't really committed you know, haven't really fulfilled a particular sin. Some the sin affects us at the level of desires and inclinations, right? So we haven't acted out on it yet, but we are affected at the level of this inclination, this lusts, this sinful desires. So, so God, by telling us, okay, yeah, that's your misery. Yes, that's your corruption. Yes, that's your sin. But remember, you belong to me because I have purchased you with the blood of the Lamb. And what does that mean? Even though you are seeing all these stains in you, right? How do we, what, how do we see ourselves when we experience a lust of the eyes, a lust of the flesh, the pride of life. That's a way that the elderly John puts it, right? The elderly John puts it in these three ways. I include that in my prayers. Father, deliver me from the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, yeah. The lust of the flesh, the pride of life, right? So when we have that and feel that burden, then God comes to our rescue. Notice point number two is our deliverance. How I am set free from all my sins and misery. And how is that? That you are forgiven. That you have been washed clean. That you have been justified. That you have been raised with Christ. That is your new position and identity. In Christ. Notice you haven't done anything yet, right? 
You're just hearing from God the affirmation of who you are in Christ. And that will become the power, the strength, the freedom, the peace to rise up again and go to the Father and work again and serve again and clean up your life again. Now, let, let's take a look at one passage that communicates this to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you know that the church of Corinth was a church um, that was deeply affected by many disorders. So, um, let's see how the Apostle Paul ministers to them. Let's see this movement that we have seen from, notice three parts, right? One, Conviction, contrition for our sin and misery. Two, our deliverance by our position in Christ. And then three, thanksgiving for such deliverance. Look at it right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. It says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. And this is not an exhaustive list, right? This is not, this is not a, a list that is by any means finished or complete. You could keep adding there the works of the flesh, right? So... Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So when we hear this and we hear the law, because that's what we're hearing now, right? We are hearing everything that is contrary to God's law. And once we see this catalog of the flesh, we're, we are bound to say there's something there that what? That applies to me. There's something there that I'm guilty of, right? There's something there that I can relate to. There's something there when I look at this law that I can say I am guilty as charged, right? Okay. So, so by the law, the Holy Spirit leads you to have what? The contrition. The sorrow, right? The repentance of being convicted of your sins so that you may turn somewhere. And where are you going to turn? Okay, yes, eventually God's going to help you turn from your sinful deeds, but repentant, that will be the fruit of the turning, okay? But the turning is to whom? To whom? To Christ, right? The turning is to Christ. This is not simply a matter of, oh, you know, liars will not inherit the kingdom of God. Stop lying that you may inherit the kingdom of God. Is that the gospel? <clears throat> no. It's not the gospel, right? Because that would be to enter the kingdom of God by the works of the law. We have a commandment, thou shalt not lie, for sure, right? Right? Which commandment is that? What number? Isaac. Lie. Hmm? I know you have a test coming up. You already had it? Well, you should know then. Huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Huh? And what is number nine? Uh -huh. Thou shalt not lie. Okay, let's, let's repeat the commandments. Let's see. First commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Number one, number one. Number two, thou shalt make no images before me, before, uh, of God. Number three, thou shalt not misuse the name of the Lord. Number four, thou shalt keep the Sabbath day holy. So these are the four that have to do with God, right? Then number five, honor your father and mother. Number six, thou shalt not commit, thou shalt not kill. 
thou shalt not kill. Number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Number eight, thou shalt not steal. Number nine, thou shalt not lie. And number ten, thou shalt not desire lust after your neighbors, what your neighbor has, okay? So, we need to hear the law. Why is that? Why do we need to hear the law? That, that's a question that I think, you know, yeah? We can know that we are not perfect since we can't, since we can't keep the law. So, so we can know that we're sinful. Sure, sure. We know our sins by the knowledge of the law. That's definitely, yeah. And uh, also, that is the will of God for us to do, right? It's the will of God. Even though we cannot keep it perfectly, but God will begin to have us bear fruit according to the law of God, right? See, if we put the law away, we're not going to have that conviction. Our conscience may fall captive to other laws of men, perhaps. Our conscience may fall captive to thou shall not, um, thou shall not um, drink uh, a beer, for example. Hmm? And thou shall not um, smoke. <laughs> Pastor, what do you mean? Those are not sins. These are examples that we use, folks, because in, even though these things are not beneficial, right? Drinking alcohol is not beneficial, right? Smoking is not beneficial, right? But they are not in themselves, what? Sinful. But what happens all of a sudden, you know, if we repeat enough, Christians do not smoke or drink, you know, we don't do this, we don't do this. All of a sudden, we feel that this is a what? A sin. And not an issue of Christian liberty and wisdom, right? And personal application and practice when it comes to the wisdom of how to interact with things such as smoking or drinking. And for that matter, a, a whole host of other things that in tradition has become um, entr entrenched or ingrained as sins. For example, a woman will not wear a certain um, piece of clothing, you know, will not wear pants, right? Um... And things of the sort. You know, you will not watch, you will not go to, to the movies, for example. Right? So these are things, how many of you in the past had these things pressed upon you as law? Right? Yeah, yeah. But if we know the law of God, <laughs> we can discern what is according and keeping with God's commandments and what is not. And from there begin to use wisdom in pursuing God's ways, right? Now, that was a little, a little tangent that I went on, but we need to know the law. Yes, because uh, if we don't know it, we don't know what the will of God is, we don't know the character of God, uh, we will invent our own laws, we will be deceived by the flesh into the pursuit of things that are not pleasing to Him, or we will try to justify ourselves by the doing of things that are not necessarily issues of sin versus, um, you know, uh, obedience. And as Isaac said, because the law of God then in convicting us of sin drives us to Christ Jesus. Okay? So that is the second movement that we're talking about. Hmm? So Christianity is not that we hear, thou shalt not lie. And then we say, oh, okay, well, let me stop lying so that I can enter the kingdom of God. Right? That is not our faith. That's not the way Christianity works. How does it work then? It works like this. Lying is not according to God's will. And God condemns lying and liars will end up in hell. 
What about me? Because I'm guilty of lying, you would say. Oh, now God is going to bring is going to bring you to whom? Where? To Christ. Right? That's the movement. It's not from lying to not lying so that I may inherit the kingdom of God. It is from lying to Christ. Let's see. Notice. 1 Corinthians 6. Nor thieves, okay, nor, you know, the whole list will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Is Paul telling this to the whole Corinthian church? Yes, right? He's addressing the whole church, even those that are guilty of some of the things that are referenced here. And he wants, with the Word of God, for the Holy Spirit to use this word to convict those that are sinning of their sin, but to lead them in repentance and faith to their position in Christ. You see that movement from your sin to the person and the work of Christ for you. So he tells them, and such were some of you, but that's no longer who you are. Yes, you may have lied. Yes, you may have stolen. Yes, you may have done something sinful, but that is no longer who you are. And how come? What do you mean if I did this? What do you mean this is not who I am? Ah, you have been what? Washed. Notice. You have been sanctified. You have been justified. You notice that? Let me ask you, are these commandments or indicatives? Indicative. Indicatives. Notice that Paul is not immediately saying, stop lying, stop committing adultery, stop stealing. He has talked about the law and what is contrary to the law. He has brought conviction to God's people. And now he says, but... And he brings the indicatives of grace. In other words, he proclaims Christ to them and says, But by faith, if you're in Christ, listen, you have been washed clean. You have been forgiven. You have been justified. You have been declared righteous. You have been purchased with a price. You belong to Christ. That is our deliverance. And the sinner that has been born again, what do you think that does in his soul? He receives a... This is the movement that we're talking about with these three parts or these three things for us to live and die in the joy of discomfort. The sinner then hears it, gets convicted of sin, feels the sorrow and the burden of his sin, but then immediately receives the joy of forgiveness. As he repents, in other words, he confesses his sin, his corruption, his misery, and he looks to Christ as his deliverer, as his savior, as the one that forgives him, as the one that has received him. And he hears from God in Christ, this is who you are, my son. You are holy. You are righteous. You're washed clean. You belong to me. I love you. That's the second movement. And what happens now? There's a third movement, right? What's the third movement now? How I am to thank God for such deliverance. So once I hear the Lord has blessed me with His forgiveness. Oh, thank you, Lord. We begin to say what? What, would, what, what are now, you know, what, what, what's the attitude that rises up when we hear ourselves forgiven? We were sad because of our sin, right? We were fearful because of our guilt, right? We felt isolated and estranged from God, right? But in the gospel being proclaimed to us and we hear the word of forgiveness and love and mercy and kindness and our position in Christ and God says, I forgive you, child. What do we experience? 
What emotions, what feelings, what attitudes, what rises up? Joy. Joy. What else? Isaac? Peace. You were afraid, you were crying. All of a sudden you feel what? Love. Comfort. How about comfort? Comfort. Right? Peace. You have been justified by faith. You have peace toward God. Oh, you know that everything is well. You know that, that you have not fallen away from the Father, that He's got you. That's through repentance and faith. So, in that peace, in that joy, in that love, in that re rest, right? Rest. We enter that rest of God's forgiveness. Then we come out wanting to what? To serve the Lord, right? To, to, to walk with Him again. To please Him again. <coughs> to thank Him. We begin to say thank you. <coughs> that is the beginning of our service unto Him. <coughs> so notice how Paul puts it in verse 20, the last verse of 1 Corinthians 6. The last verse of 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 20. For you were bought at a price. Therefore... Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So now we obey. See? We turn away from sin. We bear fruit. Right? Now, Pastor, how much fruit and how much obedience? Imperfectly. <laughs> it will never be perfect obedience and perfect fruit. But you are bearing fruit. You have begun to obey the Lord. The Lord has begun to cleanse your life, to clean up your way, to sanctify you practically and experientially. He has begun to do that in your life. Does that mean that I will not sin again? That, you know, I'm going to be sinless tomorrow and from then on? No. No. But that means that we have been made aware, we have been made convicted. We have been made, we have, we have been put on the alert. We are watching in Christ right now. You know, we are once again refreshed in Him. We once again taste and see that the Lord is good. The more we taste of His goodness, the more this appetite for Him opens up. And the less the appetite for sin allures us. Right? Because we are the closer with Him. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be tempted anymore, that we're not going to experience the lust of the eyes of flesh and the pride of life again. No, that's all there. It's going to be a constant battle. But these are the movements. In other words, what happens again tomorrow, I, have an, I, have, I had an evil thought or I had bad words that came out of my mouth. Notice, I went from thanksgiving and service to what again? To the first part again, right? Mm -hmm. What's the first part? Conviction, contrition, sorrow, repentance, faith in Christ, His love, His mercy, His kindness. Being made and put at rest again, right? A peace again in the peace of the gospel. And then made willing and ready again to what? To serve Him as His child. And that is God's movement, the movement of the Holy Spirit. We don't mean that in any mystical way. This is God's doing in our, life, in our lives, okay? So three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how I am set free from all my sins and misery. Third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. Uh, let's take a look at another passage that uh, gives us the same pattern. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6. Romans <clears throat> 
Notice in Romans chapter 6, we have this question beginning in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. So what, what word is this? This word here says, do not sin, right? That's a word of law, right? Do not sin. Do not sin. So when we hear that word, immediately what happens? By the Holy Spirit, we are convicted of what? Of, of our sin, of our corruption, of our misery. There, isn't, there, there is never going to come a time that we're going to look at ourselves under the word of the law and we're going to say, oh, I have no sin. That is the deception of many. Okay, let's make a distinction here. We have not acted out certain lusts of our flesh. That's good. Okay? So we don't want to also have the idea that because we always carry about this body of death, as Paul says, he was referring to the sinfulness and the corruption of the flesh. He's referring to that lust or the way that it's been put, and I think it's a very good metaphor, this cauldron. Have you ever seen a cauldron? You know, this, this, uh, or this pan where you're cooking something, right? And it's there, you know, cooking. Well, the flesh is like that. The flesh never stops cooking. <laughs> it's always cooking. That cauldron, it's always you know, heat it up, okay? That is why, don't be, um, uh, don't be surprised. If the more you're closer to God sometimes, the more you become aware of it. The more you become aware of it. The more, the more the Holy Spirit is calling your attention to what? To that corruption in you. Now, let me ask you, if this cauldron of corruption is your misery and you are becoming aware of it every day, actually, almost every moment, where are you running every day and every moment? To Christ, right? Now, if you're ignorant of that corruption, of that heat, of that cauldron, if you're unaware of it, okay, what are you doing? Hmm? Think about it for a moment. <clears throat> that is why the more God makes us aware of His holiness and character, and the more He makes us aware then of our fleshly corruption, the more we see how much we need Him, and the need for the cross grows in our lives. Remember that little red book, the Christ Center, the Cross Center Life? You had two lines going up like that in an angle, and these two lines, one going like that, Right? And then another one going like that. Maybe a 45 angle. But what happens to a 45 angle if you keep opening it up, right? Right? It keeps on being open, right? So just put it, put it horizontally. The angle is going like this, right? Like that. So the top line represents God's character, His holiness, right? His holiness, His character, His perfection that we come to know by way of the law and by way of the perfections that we see in Christ, right? So we see that line that represents His character, His holiness. The bottom line represents when we compare ourselves and the more we see His holiness, how do we see ourselves? Hmm? Yeah. The more we become aware of how holy He is, the more we become aware in ourselves how what? How unholy we are. So that, notice then the angle, if the first line, 
Okay, notice if, if this line is how holy God is, this line is, as I see, this, is, this would be a mathematical geometry figure here, right? If I place a point here, this is, how, this is my awareness of how holy God is. Then my awareness of how unholy I am is down here, right? And if this grows, what happens to my awareness of how unholy I am? It grows too. Proportionally. Proportionally. And then the book uses in the middle the picture of the cross, several crosses. If we keep on drawing crosses here in this space, what happens to the cross? It what? It gets bigger. So the more we discover God's holiness, His character, His purity, the more we see in our flesh our impurity, but the more we depend on the cross of Christ to bridge the gap. The more we need Christ, the more we then see that our fellowship with God depends on the riches of God's grace for us in Christ. So the more we're running to Him, the more we are filled with the love of God that yet... Yeah. So it seems like a paradox that we would say, oh, what a great sinner. See, this explains what Paul says when Paul says, I am the chief of sinners. It explains it. It's not that Paul has become, has grown in degeneracy. <laughs> it's not that Paul is growing and going from bad to worse. Not at all. The opposite. The opposite. However, Paul has grown in the awareness of what resides in his members and his flesh. And he doesn't like it one bit. But it's there. His flesh likes it. And it draws him away from God. But then, because of that movement of the Spirit and that awareness and that conviction, then he is being thrown upon the arms of the Savior daily. He's hearing, even in the midst of his corruption in the flesh, the death of God's love for him. And that sanctifies him, consecrates him, sets him apart, compels him, delivers him. Pastor, even in a practical sense, I'm sure that also there's a line, I don't know what category of line, but there's less things probably happen. Of course, of course. More and more aware so we, you know, and, and, that's, and that is our progressive sanctification, the Lord. Now, we just have to be careful with this because we don't want to be formulaic here because it sounds kind of formulaic, but we're describing the movement of the Spirit in our lives by the means of grace, by the preaching of law and gospel, by repentance and faith, and this is a continual walk. It doesn't mean that now mathematically, if you live now 10 years, well, you're going to have X number of, of fruits. And you know, and you know what? That is the will of God for you, that you increase more and more. No question about it. We don't make any qualms about affirming that the will of God for us is that we increase more and more and abound in every good fruit and work of the Lord. That is God's will for us. But this is life. And, um, you know, God has His plans. We depend on Him. We continually seek Him, you know. And, um, and He will be glorified through the lives of believers in different ways. You may have the likes of, of the Apostle Paul. And you may have the likes of Samson. <laughs> You know, Samson was used of the Lord tremendously. Uh, sometimes, you know, I usually knock him down because of all his womanizing. But, uh, you know, he was used of the Lord mightily. You know, and he had this battle with the flesh. And he succumbed to it often. Okay? And, and he was disobedient in, in some areas of his life for which he paid dearly. The Lord disciplined him. There were consequences in his life. However, his, he was still God's child. He is mentioned and referenced in Hebrews 11, Samson by faith. 
And there he is in the last moment in his life still slaying God's enemies by the power of God. Not amazing? So, he used the word compel. Yeah. But that's not a word that the majority of evangelicals use. No, that's true. And they don't understand that. Mm -hmm. Because we have that in, in, uh, in the Gospel of John, all that the Father compels shall come. Yeah. You know, they use uh, draw. They use Draws us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Not, it's not a good well, yeah, it's you know there there's some uh, I think there's some correlation of meanings there. Uh, at the end of the day, is that the Father works in us in ways that He overcomes. He the Bible says that He works in us to will and to do according to His pleasure. So that is a compelling. The compelling comes by way of the wooing, this irresistible wooing of love. It's not that we are forced. Sometimes I think some reform detrimentally have addressed this as a drawing that it seems like it's kicking and screaming against our will. No, no. He molds our wills by, by, the, by the power of the Spirit of God and the revelation of Christ and the removing of the blinds and the conforming of our lives in Christ, He is revealing deeper and deeper what Paul says in Ephesians 3, the depth, the height, the width of God's love, that we may be filled with the fullness of God. See? I think we see that whenever we come to church and we're not feeling it or whatever and and we leave yeah. and it's awesome sure you know the lord has done the absolutely work. because it's not based on feelings it's more in other words it's more than feelings it's more than emotions this is a very objective reality of the peace that exists between us and god this is a very objective reality of the covenantal relationship that now we have with God in our head in Christ Jesus. So, this is not that we need to seek after this feeling of this emotion, of this peace. And until I have all this, oh my goodness, woe is me. No, no, no. You may, you may not feel a thing one day or many days or a season. You may be in turmoil in your spirit. In your, in your being, and yet God may speak to you His peace. He, he gra it's a grounding. It's a grounding. See, it's sort of like, um, how many of you have seen a, a good anchor boat, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in the midst of a, of a wavy, tossed, uh, right, ocean, right? It's being battered, it's being, you know, it's moving and all that, but it's not, it's not, it's not it hasn't been cast off, right? It's not drifting off. So we may, our times, our lives may be all wavy and it feels like turmoil and, and we feel all kinds of nasty feelings and emotions and thoughts, okay? However, as we get this rescue from outside of us, the gospel, it's dropped in our ears, the gospel is dropped in our mouth. <laughs> the gospel is dropped in our body. The gospel is reverberates in our ears with songs. The gospel is communicated in prayer. The peace of God that surpasses understanding. Notice that surpasses understanding because there's no reason why in the midst of all this waviness or this panic attack that I just went through or this depression that I've been affected by or this deep grieving because I lost a loved one or this sense of uh, frustration and pain because a friend betrayed me or a spouse left me. Somehow in the midst of all of that, there is an anchor that speaks peace to my soul. That pacifies me, right? That causes me to keep on trusting and believing. That causes me to put another foot in front of the other, right? 
It causes me to pray again, to ask again, to sing again, to abide, to persevere, to keep on hoping, to keep on waiting, to keep on drawing near Him. That's what we're talking about, folks. We're not talking about stop suffering. We're not talking about this movement is the recipe for you to stop suffering. <laughs> no. We're talking that this comfort that's being described here, and, and it's good that we're emphasizing this, lest we think that this comfort has just to do with some sort of a therapeutic intervention of God where now everything has to be all right in your life. Everything all right in the way you're thinking. Everything all right with your emotions. Everything all right with your finances. That's not what we're talking about, folks. Everything was not all right in Paul's life. <laughs> it was not. There was pain. And at times there were needs and wants and sorrow and tears and attacks and frustrations and rejections. And the ship anchor didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Three times. You know, there was, there, were, there was all kinds of turmoil in Paul's life, yet... <clears throat> The power of God was with him and he persevered and he grew and he learned to trust God all the more through the weaknesses and through the thorns and the storms of life. Does that make sense? That at the end of the day we don't can't explain it but we find ourselves believing, trusting. Actually we find ourselves even that we have, if you look back in your life as we have walked in grace folks, I ask you, look back 10, 15, 20 years back in your life. Maybe, maybe two, three, four years. And look at your life in relationship with God and where you're at today. And, where, and, and how this life is manifesting in your life. Have you come to see a type of maturity that is not this triumphalistic, touchy, feely, material, temporal, earthly, but a kind of maturity that somehow you can't explain it, but you're just trusting God. Your faith has increased. You, you, you feel secure and drawn closer to Him. You know, you wake up and, and you fill your heart with gratitude and praise. You know, you, you get this perspective on life where, where now things come your way and, and yeah, they still, they're rough and they can shake you and all that. But you're saying, you know, I've been through some of this before. The Lord's been faithful. He will see me through. You, you see yourself connecting with brothers and sisters. You see yourself, you know, not, you know, in this quagmire of, uh, of despair. You see yourself more stable, more mature, more patient, perhaps more kind. Hey, that's a fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> He's doing it in our lives, you know? R.C. Spoil Jr. Yeah. was criticized. Mm. And, he, and he was told, oh, you're, you're a theology, mm. uh, you're, you're a sock puppet. <clears throat> and, and Jr. said, you're actually correct. Mm. I am just a sock. Hands <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, 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 go ahead. World, also the, you're saying the wooing, right? And the changing and, and the winning over. I mean, <coughs> I, I, I know that all of us can relate to this, how, how the Lord comes in a day where you don't want to hear anything. And he just wins you over. So there's so, it, it's yep. overwhelming. Right, right. There's nothing. Yeah. You start off with this bad temper or whatever, sure. and you don't want to do this, and you don't want right. to do this. Right, right, yeah. To, and you know what? Before you know it, yeah. he's done what the beloved does. That's so right. He's loved you in such a way that you just can't say no anymore. Yeah. And he's changed your will. That's right. Without he's, having to go against him. And he's, and he's shown you where the meal is. Yeah. He's shown you how to feed. Yeah. You know, he, you, you, you may have had the worst day, but then, you know, this, these are signs of maturity. You say, tomorrow's another day. There will be gospel tomorrow again. 
You know, the, the, the Sunday, man, it was, it was a wreck yesterday. But, ah, right. But I know with the meal, let me go and meet with God's people. Let me, let me run to the house of the Lord. See? You know? Ah, let me just go back in there and say I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, it was awful, man. We had a, the full out was incredible. Oh, but no, no. Oh, Lord, please. You know, and we're back at it again. We're back at it again. And that's why we're so thankful. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, it's, it's, it's non relenting. His love does not relent. It's invincible. It's, it's uh, you know, it, we're, we're more than conquerors. Why? Conquerors can be conquered. <laughs> to go beyond that, I think what I read into that is, or I read out of that, is metaphor. Yeah. We're more than conquerors because we will never be conquered. In other words, the conquering that has conquered us, which is in Christ, is indomitable. It is now invincible. Yes, That's right. It's over. It's finished. Amen. So read Roman, in Romans 6, you have a similar pattern. You know, you heard, do not sin, right? And then you come further down to verse 11. This is, this is a very special verse for me. You probably realized it by now. Where it says, therefore, likewise, verse 11, verse 10 and 11, notice, Christ, His deliverance for you, his death and His resurrection. For the death that He died, verse 10, He died to sin once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. Verse 11, notice this movement. Likewise, you also, you also, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We haven't done anything. And God is affirming proclaiming over us our union with Christ. God is putting us to death and renewing us in the resurrection and the life of Christ. We see our sin and God is putting that old man, that's, that's death, that's condemnation, and you die to it. That is no longer who you are because you died in Christ. You're crucified with Him. And what's more, you are risen with Christ and your life is hidden in Him. Pursue Him. Therefore, we, we, here we come. This is the way that we are to live. Verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Do not let it reign. Do not let it prevail. Do not let it overtake you. Because you're not captive to sin anymore. You see? Yes, you do sin, and yes, it will affect you, but it's not your ruler. Understand that, okay? You can now bear the fruit of the Spirit. As we hear then further on down, verse 20 of Romans 6, For when you were slaves of sin, notice that, when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You know what that means? When you were slaves to sin, you could not bear fruit of righteousness. You could not bear any fruit of righteousness at all. Because you were slaves to sin. But now, notice, what fruit did you have in the things of which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. If you had been left in that state, in that condition, in that position, you would have gone to hell, right? But now having been set free from sin, how? By the forgiveness of Christ, by the righteousness of Christ, by the sanctification of Christ, your position in Him by His death and resurrection, you have been set free from sin. Understand here, you can now bear fruit against it. Do not understand here, you have been rid of sin. <laughs> That's what many people, unfortunately, want to interpret, and that is wrong. There's still sin in our members, in our flesh, in the old men. But... Sin is no longer your master. You're not owned by it. 
You are owned by God. You belong to Christ. You've been set free to be able to bear fruit because you're a child of God. So your walk is now the freedom of sanctification. Bearing fruit in the Spirit. And what is the end of that? Notice. Verse 22, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. Even, even before that, if you go to verse 15, he asks a similar question. Oh yeah, he repeats that, definitely. And then he doubles down on grace so that we may be captured again in this movement of Death and resurrection, repentance and faith, the renewal, the mortifying of the old man and the flesh, and the quickening of the spirit unto the newness of life. Any questions on that? Folks, with that in mind, let's pass the elements. Let's put gospel in our mouths. Hmm? <laughs> let's put the body of Christ, the body and the blood of Christ in our mouth, in bread and wine. Because he says, this is my body, this is my blood. That does not mean that the elements become the body and the blood. What that means is that Jesus is connected to it. He's there with the word and the elements. He's there for you in such a way, in such a way that when you eat the bread, when you drink the wine, He's saying, I am giving myself to you. If you can trust anything else, because we're not called to trust anything else first, remember this. It's not just a remembrance of, oh, just remember 2,000 years ago. Yeah, remember that. But it's a remembrance into the presence. The, what we're going to do now, the table of the Lord and the body and the blood, the wine, and the bread, it's a remembering that communicates and delivers Christ to us now as He died once for all for our sins. It's not also, it's not either that we are sacrificing Him again, as if we are now offering a sacrifice unto Him. Somehow we are, we are doing a sacrifice now. No. The sacrifice that He delivered unto us and for us once and for all, this remembering, this participating, is God's way of becoming present with you. Right now saying what we have just said, what we have just said in word, also capture it in the elements. That's, that's basic. Sometimes we... We use too many words. <laughs> we already spoke the gospel. What he said to you in word, now with the word he adds these elements and says, my, my blood is, is given for you. That's your life. My flesh is your flesh. My bones are your bones. So feed on me. I am your head. I am your humanity before God. I am your representative. I, I am your husband. I am your forgiveness. You know? And as you go and the enemy wants to co cause you to question, you remember, I ate the, the bread and I drank the blood. Remember that. Remember your baptism. I was baptized. You know, I, I, I died to the old men because Christ died for me. I, I've been washed clean in the blood of Christ. And I've, I've risen with Him. As you feel the corruption of the flesh and your sin and guilt and the actors and all that, yes, you're convicted and you confess and all that. And then where, where are you going to hang on to? Remember your baptism. Remember that water. As I, you know, I did that. And that was, that was God saving me. I've eaten. That's God saving me. I was baptized. That is God nourishing me. I ate. That is God nourishing me. 
I was baptized, I've eaten, I've drunk at the, at the Lord's table. That is God sealing me. Hold on to that. Don't think this is just some... You, don't you see in books sometimes you have appendixes, right? The, sometimes we don't even read them, right? Or the bibliography. This is not some type of bibliography at the end. No, no, no. This is part of the gospel for you. So with that in mind, folks, uh, let's pass it around. Gordon, let me, uh, Omar, yes. No, stay, stay down, Gordon. Omar, Omar will help us here. And Pastor Oscar, if you would uh, pass this on the other side. In question 75, as we pass around the elements, in question 75 of the Catechism, if you have it there, you can turn so you can read it with me. Uh, it says, How does the Lord's Supper remind you and assure you that you share in Christ's one sacrifice on the cross and in all His gifts? Answer, in this way, Christ has commanded me and all believers to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup. With this command, he gave this promise. Yep. Thank you. you Maybe see it. Okay. Oh, you got it. All right. Thank you. With this command, he gave this promise. First, as surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup given to me, so surely his body was offered and broken for me and his blood poured out for me on the cross. As surely as I receive from the hand of the one who serves and tastes with my mouth the bread and cup of the Lord, given me as sure signs of Christ's body and blood, so surely he nourishes and refreshes my soul for eternal life with his crucified body and poured out blood. The next question, 76 what does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink His poured out blood? It means to accept with a believing heart the entire suffering and death of Christ and by believing to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But it means more. Through the Holy Spirit who lives both in Christ and in us, we are united more and more to Christ's blessed body. And so, although He is in heaven and we are on earth, we are flesh of His flesh and bone of His bone. And we forever live on and are governed by one spirit as members of our body are by one soul. Uh, this is great. Uh, praise the Lord. Lastly, question 79. Why does Christ call the bread his body and the cup his blood, or the new covenant in his blood? Paul uses the words a participation in Christ's body and blood. Answer. Christ has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that as bread and wine nourish our temporal life, so too his crucified body and poured out blood, truly nourish our souls for eternal life. But more important, he wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, share in his true body and blood as surely as our mouths receive these holy signs in his remembrance and that all of his suffering and obedience are as definitely ours 
as if we personally had suffered and paid for our sins. So it is a seal and a pledge. It's kind of like the engagement ring, right? So every time we eat, it's, it's God again pledging. It's God giving himself and pledging himself and says, you know, I am yours forever. And that seal strengthens, nourishes our faith. And, and then we hear in Corinthians where the Apostle Paul says, you know, do this, discerning the Lord's body. Discerning, in other words, this movement that we talked about, do it in repentance and faith. Do it understanding that the reason Christ was given for you is because you're a sinner. And the reason he has died for you is because of the corruption and the death of the old Adam in you. And in that knowledge and assurance, then receive this sign and pledge once again, saying, yes, I need you, Savior. Strengthen me. <clears throat> Forgive me. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your deliverance. And renew me. In other words, if we have sinned, if we are down, <clears throat> if we are trapped, come to the table and be renewed in Him. Don't come to the table and take it for granted. or No, no, come to the table and ask of the Father as you see what is done for you, as you confess your sins, as you are convicted, as you call upon the name of the Lord. Ask Him. Lord, deliver me from this, for I am yours. Help me with this, for I am yours. I thank you for your deliverance. With that in mind, the words of the Lord, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let us eat. Then he took the cup and gave thanks. And gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us drink. The Lord again pledges. Huh? His life unto us and His sacrifice, saying unto you, church, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. Amen.